Thank you for the great joy you've given me to be here with you all. God bless you. Thank you for the very gracious welcome from our dear brother and the lovely words from the Word of God that he brought to us. This morning, I was speaking over at the Youth Bible School and I held out at the beginning of that message this morning a verse in the Bible that staggered my heart. In Hebrews 9, verse 27, it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, God says. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, after this one thing, God says, judgment, judgment. Revelation chapter 20 verse 11 I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place to them and I saw the dead small and great stand before God and the books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works and the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Into the lake of fire. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, after this, the judgment, the judgment. I would like for us tonight to consider this question. I would like for us tonight to consider this thought. If you face death, if you face death, Right now, right now, right now, it is possible, you know, or don't, don't you think that's possible? Don't you think that's possible? I was preaching back in my country in a town called Port Alfred a few years ago. And God was moving in that town through that week of meetings. And that particular night as I was standing in the pulpit of God, a burden came in my heart that was unusual. Such a crushing burden I began to hold on to the pulpit crying out. A deep compassion and care and burden for the people I was preaching to suddenly halfway through that sermon in the front row of that church. A man was sitting, he suddenly slumped forward. And I was the first to see. And I went from the pulpit and ran down to where he was slumping forward. And I called for any nurse or doctor. The nurse rushed forward and took his pelt and looked up at me and said, He's gone. This man is dead. This man has died, sir. And a tear came down her face. Oh, suddenly the tears came down my face. That this man had died while I was preaching. I couldn't carry on preaching. I looked at the congregation in brokenness and I, I said to the stunned congregation, this man has passed away. He's died. We can't go on. I want you to go now. I want you to get up and I want you to go to your home and come back tomorrow to the next meeting. And I saw in stunned silence all the people from this town gathered in this big church standing and turning 
and beginning to walk out in the absolute stunned silence out toward the door. And suddenly, suddenly my heart just rent and I cried out, I cried out loud, if you face death right now, if you face death right now, right now, would you be ready to meet with God? Would you be ready to meet with God? If you face death right now, would you face it having prepared to meet with God? When I was first married about 18 years ago, I was preaching in Cape Town, the town we were living at the first few years of our marriage, Cape Town of South Africa, in one of the churches in Musenberg, which is a long beach. There's all the houses around. I was preaching a series of meetings. I was in the church that day, going over the sermon, preparing, soaking myself in prayer and in the Word of God, preparing myself to preach. And then I looked out and I saw what a lovely day it was and felt I should go for a walk along the beach, which was just a little way away from the church, to get my mind clear, to get some fresh air. So I went down to the beach and I wanted to just preach. And so I began to pray as I walked along the beach. And went over my message, started going over my message aloud. And I went away from where there were folks, where the crowds were. And I began to just walk and walk, and walk, and walk, until I was out of sight of everyone. Just walking, praying, talking to God, weighing up the message, preparing myself. It didn't occur to me that I was in any danger, walking away so far alone, out of sight of everyone. Suddenly, two men came as swiftly as you can imagine, so fast I couldn't believe it. Suddenly they appeared over the dunes, coming toward me. And I looked around, and I realized no one was in sight. I had walked so far, just praying, preaching, going over my sermon. And I looked at these two men coming, and suddenly I realized these men were evil. As I looked at their faces, these men were evil. They came so fast, one behind me, one in front pulled out these long blades, swishing, screaming like animals. I could do nothing. But I just looked at these blades, missing me by just a fraction of an inch. And there they were screaming. The one pulled me down. The other got on top of me. And this one holding me back said, Kill him. Kill him. And suddenly I saw blood all over. Forgive me, I don't mean to shock you. I didn't feel any pain, but I knew I was hurting badly all over. They were hurting me, these long blades. And this man, on top of me, lifting up this blade, I looked at his eyes at the hatred. The political situation in South Africa bred such hatred. And there he was looking at me with his hatred and I thought to myself, how could someone who knows nothing about me hate me so much as this? How could someone who knows nothing about me hate me so much as this? And he shouted, I hate you people. We hate you people. I'm going to kill you. And suddenly, my thoughts, my thoughts began to check what was going on. And the most amazing thing happened. The most amazing thing happened right at that moment. As I thought to myself, my time is gone. I'm going home right now. 
never to be hurt by the devil again, never to face any more hurt or temptation or onslaught from Satan. I'm going home to Jesus. Right now, my time is finished. I'm going to heaven right now. And as these thoughts came in my mind, welling up in my heart came a joy, a peace that passes all understanding like a wave of divine love flowing through me. The joy that welled up at the thought that I'm going to Jesus right now for all eternity to be safe in his arms. And I felt this joy welling up so much I began to worship God in a way I never knew I could worship God. And suddenly this man standing over me began to weep and he shouted at me, how can you say such things when you know you're going to die? How can any man die like this? How can you say such things? How can you have no fear of death like this? I looked at him and I said, it's because I'm a Christian. You see, I've prepared to meet with God. I've been washed in the blood of Jesus. I have no judgment facing me of any sin. It's all been washed in the blood through the death of Christ. There's a verse in the Bible that says, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him, fear him which is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Suddenly this man got up and he cried loud. And the other man got up from behind me and he began to hit this man, swearing and cursing at him. And he says, what are you crying for? We hate these people. Kill him, man. And this man said, no. No. What I have done here today to you, sir, is a terrible mistake. I have been so wrong what I've done to you. I have made a terrible mistake. And the other man looked at me and I began to speak to them about God. And the other man started crying. And then he said, let's just get away from him, let's just get away from him. And they began to run. And as they ran, they turned around and they looked and the one was weeping so loud. He was just sobbing as he looked back at me. And I looked at them and I cried out loud to them, Oh, I want to see you in heaven. I want to see you in heaven. I want to know you've been saved. That I didn't go through this for nothing. You seek God to save you. I want to see you in heaven. And they looked at me and while they cried, they just ran, weeping. I somehow got up. I made my way back and they found me, took me to a hospital, contacted my wife. And there I sat while they were stitching me up in the hospital and my wife holding my hand. And then I began to think. I began to reason as I sat there holding your hand. And I said to God in my heart, Oh God, why would thou allow such a thing to have happened to me? I wasn't out there in sin. I wasn't out there with folly that I needed to be rebuked and chastened. I was out there in prayer. I was preparing. I was going over a sermon to preach to me. Why would thou allow such a thing to happen to me? And suddenly God spoke to me. In my heart, oh, no man will ever tell me it was not God. His voice echoed in my heart. I allowed this. I allowed this to happen to you. To show you how every man could die. 
with peace that passes all understanding, no matter how they have to die. I allowed this to show you how every man could die if they prepared to meet me as you have, with peace that passes all understanding, with joy welling up worship. No matter how they have to face death. Oh, if you face death right now, would you face it? Would you face it having prepared to meet with God? If you face death right now, right now, would you face it having prepared to meet with God? Would you face it having God's peace? that passes all understanding. There's no understanding how God can give you such peace at such a moment, but He gives it. Death has lost its sting. The grave has lost its victory. If you face death, Right now, right now, would you face it with men's blood on your hands? Will you answer that question, every one of you? Every one of you, right now to God. If you're not here for God, what on earth are you doing here? You now give God an answer who's waiting for an answer. If you faced death right now, right now, would you face it with men's blood on your hands? With men's blood on your hands? Answer God. Answer God. Anne Smith. Anne Smith was a girl, 20. When I was a young fellow at Bible school, at theological seminar, this family, the Smith family, one of the godliest homes in our nation, her father was the most loved preacher of our time in South Africa. This family took me under their wing, and I loved them for their godliness. But here was Anne, one of their daughters, backslidden. Oh, so backslidden she was going into the world for sin. As a girl, she gave her life to Christ and truth. As a girl, she knew what it was to have quiet time, consistency, to confess Christ to people, to walk with God. She knew God, but now somehow she was back tasting what the devil wanted her to taste. Is that possible? It is. It's beyond understanding. I have never been able to grasp, not to the smallest degree, how it's possible that you could have tasted Christ's love, Christ's presence, Christ's power, been communing with God, heard His voice, speaking, spending time with Christ along with Jesus. And then after having tasted God as your friend and companion to, to go back to what the devil holds out to you and says, this will satisfy you. How is it possible? I don't know. It's beyond understanding how anyone could ever listen to Satan again once you've tasted of Christ. Oh, a backslider is the most amazing thing on earth. I don't understand it. There's no understanding. There's no way of explaining it. Anne was backslidden. And there she was going off into the world, breaking her godly mother's heart. Her father had just died. This godly man. I remember talking to her about what she was doing. She said, Oh, Keith, don't think I enjoy sin. I'm not going to lie. I'm not enjoying it. I just can't. Don't think I enjoy walking out of that door and knowing my mother now gets on her knees as I shut the door and doesn't get up from her knees until I come home. Don't think I can enjoy sin knowing that. Oh, she said, even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful. 
I laugh, but I'm sorrowing. I looked at her as she walked out one night, determined to go back to the world, though we longed for her to stay there. And I said, oh, Anne, what is God going to have to do to you? What is God going to do to you to make you come back out of sin? What is God going to have to do to you, Anne? Two weeks later, they found she was riddled with cancer. Twenty years old. Opened her up. So riddled with cancer, they just closed her up and said she's got days to live. There she lay dying. Dying. Oh, she clung to God in desperation to cleanse her by the blood for her sins, for trampling afresh on the blood of Christ. Oh, how desperate she sought God while she had breath in her body to be able to face eternity. But then when she had confessed everything with such desperation and longing to be cleansed and forgiven afresh and be able to face God. She did something that staggered everyone, staggered everyone. She didn't sit back and say, let me die. I've been given time to get right with God. And in her dying day said, bring my friend here. I must speak to them. And they came. She begged them to come. And there she lay dying, she was dying, as they came and began to weep looking at her. And she said, forgive me, I never warned you. While I was in sin with you, I knew you were going to hell. I knew what we were doing, you would go straight to hell. I never warned you, forgive me, but I must warn you now, you're going to hell. If you die, you go straight to hell. For eternity, you'll be judged by God. Unless you repent and come to Christ. Oh, come to Christ. Repent from your sins. Don't go to hell. She begged them. They wept. As the next one came and she begged the next one. The next one came. She begged the next one weeping. Begging them as she lay dying. And then there were those that wouldn't come. She said to the nurse, you take this telephone number, you say to him, oh, you wouldn't come, but I want to give you this message. You're going to hell unless you repent from your sins. Forgive me that I didn't warn you. I beg your forgiveness. I should have warned you. Oh, come to Christ that you don't go to hell. Get saved by the blood of Christ. The nurse comes back. Did you tell him he's going to hell? Yes, I did. The nurse said, weeping. Take this phone number. Phone him. Tell him the same. He's going to hell. Until the moment came in Anne Smith's life when she sat back on that bed and she could not think of one single soul left on earth whose blood would be on her hands. She had warned everyone who she neglected to warn. She had taken everyone and begged them. Oh, she didn't want to face God with men's blood on her hands. She didn't want to face God with men's blood on her hands. She was desperate not to face God with men's blood on her hands. Tell me, if you face death right now, if you face death right now, would you face it with men's blood on your hands? You never warned them because you were backslidden. The only reason you never warned them is because you're backslidden. It's not possible for you to be right with God and not warn every soul God will give account to you to and ask you to give account of. It is impossible for a man not to warn every soul God intends them to. If you're rightly related to God, the only reason you sit here tonight with men's blood in your hands is if you're backslidden. Not a little bit, greatly backslidden. Don't doubt that, and I would be a liar in the pulpit to say any different. If you face death right now, would you face it with men's blood on your hands? 
You never warned them. You never warned them. You never warned them because you were backslidden. If you faced death right now, if you are a blind leader of the blind, think carefully here. If you are a blind leader of the blind, and one of the blind who you are leading, sir, face death right now, what would you say to him? What would you say to him if you were a blind leader of the blind and one of the blind who you were leading faced death right now? What would you say to him? I was preaching a number of years ago back in South Africa in a German community called Stutterheim in the eastern cape of southern Africa. In the Lutheran church, the other churches were joining in the whole town was joining in for a crusade. I had miscalculated the time to get from where I was leaving to get to this place in time for the first meeting. And I realized I'm late. When I drove into that town, I got as quickly as I could to the home I was going to stay. Took my bags out. The lady said, oh, you're late. The meeting started. Put your bags down. Get in your suit. Go down. And then she said to me, but before you go, there's a man been here all day waiting for you. We expected you way back in the day. It's the Anglican minister, the Church of England minister of this town. He wants to speak to you. You'll have to speak to him, even though it's so late. So I quickly got myself ready, walked through to the lounge, and there was this minister. And I said, sir, we're late. Can't just wait until after the meeting. He said, no, I must pray with you. I must pray with you. I've heard your tapes. I've been waiting. I must pray with you. And so I said, pray. He bowed his head and began to weep, began to groan for God to come to start a heart, for God to save souls. He agonized. I opened my eyes and looked at this man, weeping and groaning. And then he grabbed me and said, let's go. You come in my car. We go. We got there. I stood up to preach, and as I was preaching, I looked at him sitting in the congregation, weeping, in prayer, in prayer, groaning for souls. After that service, when the people were all dispersing, I walked up to this minister, and I said, Sir, you've got to forgive me for saying this, but not every town I go to does the High Church of England, the Anglican minister, come and weep for souls before anybody else but me. And he looked at me and he started to weep again. He said, oh, but Keith, I was a blind leader of the blind. For over 20 years I stood in a pulpit preaching as an unsaved man. I was blind and I was a blind leader of the blind, leading them into the ditch where I was going. I was so sincere. I wanted to serve God. I thought I was serving God. In the mornings I would take the prayer book. I would go for an hour, sometimes two, and pray the prayers to God every morning. Some form of devotion. I would spend hours seeking for a message that would help people to walk with God, to come close to God. I would stand up and deliver that message so faithfully for 20 years. I poured out my life trying to serve God, but I was blind. Leading the blind into the ditch. And then in this town of Stutterheim, we haven't got a large hospital when there's a real tragedy, a real terrible accident. We have an ambulance service here and we have to be on duty too many times every day. But if anything serious happens, we can take them down to the larger hospitals down in East London or King Williamstown. He said, I was on duty one day. The phone rang and said, there's a terrible accident just outside of the town. And I rushed down there. The ambulance was waiting with the other man who was on duty. And there were crowds gathering. And I walked through and I looked down and there was a young man who had grown up from a boy under my preaching to a man, now a young man. And I looked and his body had been ripped apart. 
And I thought he was dead, and I went down on my knees and looked at him, and his eyes focused on me, and he was dying. And he said, Father, that's what they call the Anglican minister, Father, thank God it's you. I'm dying. I'm dying, but I can't face God. I'm so full of sin. Help me to face God, Father. Help me. He looked at him. The other people suddenly pushed him aside and pushed somehow his body, what was left of it, onto the stretcher, pushed him into the ambulance, and they said, you go, you be with him, he needs you, and they drove off. He pulled this boy up in his arms, and this boy looked at him again with desperation and said, help me, I am dying, I'm going right now, help me, I can't face God, help me to face God. And this man looked at him and felt for his prayer book. He couldn't pray without a prayer book. And he looked stunned. How, how does he help a man so condemned by sin to face God right now? And suddenly he saw in this young man's eyes from this desperation suddenly came condemnation as he realized this man couldn't help him at all to face God. He died with his eyes open with condemnation. Oh, oh, he looked at me, this minister, and said, Keith, I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't preach. I wouldn't go back in the pulpit. I refused to go in the pulpit. I thought, has anyone ever, ever been able to face God through anything I've done in 20 years? when it comes to sin. What have I done to help men to find God and truth? That they can face God concerning sin and truth. When I looked at that boy's eyes, I knew he wasn't going to God. No one knew what to do with me. I just went. My mind just snapped. It just snapped. And then some Christians came and walked up to me one day and said, you're coming with us. You're not going on like this. You're coming to hear the truth. And they took me reluctantly. I went down to King Williamstown to where there was a series of meetings, a young fellow preaching the gospel. And as I stood there and saw all the people from everywhere and I realized everyone knows me, I said, I can't go in like this. Look at me. Look at me. How can I face all these people like this? He was broken. I'll stand at the door. I won't go in. I'll listen. But just leave me at the door. Don't force me in there, please. i listen. And he stood there and this young man stood in the pulpit and started preaching the gospel. And after a while, he said, I stood there and I thought to myself, Oh, I know these verses are in the Bible, but I've never, ever been able to put it like that. How is it that it, how is it I've never been able to understand, but this person is preaching that a child could understand? How is it I have never understood what I knew was in this book? How is it possible that I began to sob aloud and weep? As I heard the gospel that a child could come to God in moments that I'd never known to give man. I fell down on my knees and they came out and they heard me sobbing aloud. And I cried, oh God, I'm a blind leader of the blind. Save my soul. Save me by the blood of Jesus. He said, Keith, I stood up as they helped me up. And suddenly, as I looked at them, I knew I was born of God. The Holy Spirit bore witness with my spirit that I was the child of God. I began right there, worshipping God. I just started worshipping and shouting. Oh, I got back in the pulpit the next Sunday, and I cried out to my congregation, I have been a blind leader of the blind. I haven't helped anyone, anyone to God. But now I see 
And I want all of you to see. I want all of you to come to Christ. I don't want one of you not to come to Christ. He preached the gospel and they came to God. Oh, he said, Keith, I don't know of any Anglican in my church that is not born of God since God gave me the truth. Do you know he went to the minister's fraternal where all the ministers gathered, unsaved ministers and saved, and he told them all what happened to them. And then he said, I don't care if it's your people. I'm not going to sleep still, but you won't keep me. I'm going to every home to beg them to come to Christ. He did. No one stopped him. He went from home to home and he implored them to seek God. He told them of the hell that awaits them, of the heaven they could gain, of the Christ that can save them from hell. He begged them home after home. A minister who went to every home. of Christ because he found Christ now himself. Oh, if you are a blind leader of the blind sitting here tonight and one of the blind, one of the blind who you are leading face death right now, what would you say to them, sir? What would you say to them, sir? Come to Christ yourself, sir. And then go back to your pulpit, sir. And tell them what you found tonight. If you knew that your enemy was to face death right now, would you still regard him as your enemy? Would every one of you unto God right now. If you knew that your enemy was to face death right now, would you still regard him as your enemy? I was preaching in a town a number of years ago. I won't tell you the name of this town, though many talk of this all over my land, but I won't name the name of the town. And as I was preaching, God began to do something particularly precious in that town. Souls began to come. Souls began to seek God. Oh, the whole town was stirred. As souls from across that town began seeking God. The Christians were rejoicing. Rejoicing at God finally answering their prayers to that town. Oh, the town was staggered. We all were rejoicing at the amount, the amazing amount that came to Christ in those meetings from all over the town. And so I left rejoicing. Three weeks later, I drove in my car and I was going past that town to another town further on into the country to preach again. But before I got to this town where God so worked, I drove into a farm just before the town to a godly farmer who had been in those meetings, he walked out and he was weeping. Oh, Keith, all oh, hell has broken loose. The devil isn't happy. Oh, it's like all oh, hell has broken loose against what God has done. You cannot believe who's fighting. They're wanting to excommunicate those who talk of being saved. There's persecution. People have been driven out of their churches. People have been ostracized. People are being tragically affected on every level of life because they are professing to know Christ as their Savior. They're suffering down there through what God has done. Three men, I dare not tell you who these men were. Three men were the ones who fought with such anger and hatred at what God had done and you would not believe who those three men were. I walked away weeping. I said, leave me. And I went out into the field of the farm and I got on my knees and I said, oh God, stop this. Stop what the devil is doing to hurt all the fruit of this mission. 
Do anything, God, do anything, but stop these men from so destroying and hurting and fighting the work of God. Stop them, God. And I was praying. Suddenly this farmer came out after about 30 minutes of me praying. Got on his knees, weeping aloud. He said, oh, Keith, all three men have fallen dead. They just phoned me. All three have died in the last 30 minutes. It's the judgment of God, he said. I looked at him, and I pushed him, and I said, go away from me. And he ran. I fell on my face, and I wept, and I said, no, God, don't do this. I didn't mean to this, God. I don't want to serve thee anymore, God, if this happens to men. No, God, no, God, please, no. Don't you judge me for what happened to those men? I aged years for that. I aged years when that happened. I didn't want that. And though the whole town Though the whole town, unsaved included, every unsaved, I believe, said loudly it was God's judgment, for they knew it was God that had worked. I learned something there that transformed my life. I learned why Jesus said, love your enemies. Do you know how critical it is to do that? Do you know what an obligation it is for you to love your enemies? To bless them that curse you, to do good to them that hate you, to pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you? Do you know what God is meaning there? Do you know how dangerous it is for a man to fight God? He's not your enemy, you don't have enemies, that he's made himself your enemy, he isn't your enemy, you aren't his enemy. You must love him. You must bless him. You must do good to him. You must pray for him. Oh, when men have come from that day to this and fought against what God is doing, I beg them, I weep, don't. Don't. I beg them, don't. It isn't me. You fight it, God. You're in danger. It's not my message. It's God's message. You fight. Oh. Every one of you, I know many have suffered persecution when you made your stand for God, but can I ask you all something? If you knew that your enemy was to face death, Right now, would you still regard him as your enemy? Is it not time to love them, whatever they've done to you? To pray so for them with such compassion? If your son face death right now. You think that's not possible, sir? If your son faced death right now, what would you say to him? What would be your last words to him? If your son faced death right now, your son, your blood faced death right now, what would be your last words to him? When I was a young preacher, there was a little boy called Timothy from a godly home. His grandfather had been a wonderfully used man of God. His father was a preacher in the Salvation Army. And here Timothy was at the youth camps. When I was a young fellow, we all played games in between. And then we preached. And we all loved Timothy, his little character. There he was, his parents sending him off from this age with his brothers and sisters to all the youth camps to hear the word of God. Well, 
Timothy swiftly grew up to a teenage boy and he was good looking and the girls liked him. And I used to watch from the back when people were preaching, weeping about hell from the pulpit. There was Timothy kicking the girl's feet while hell was being preached in the pulpit. And I looked and I said, oh, oh, Timothy, it's like water off a duck's back. He's heard everything, but he hasn't allowed it to get to the heart, and now it's like water for ducks. But he can be playing the fool while hell has been preached. And I knew he hadn't met with God by a teenager. He was still playing with sin. He was so popular. Oh, we loved him. I loved him for his character. But I feared for his soul. I feared for his soul. I went away, preaching all over, years went by, and one day they asked me back to this particular situation where they had these youth camps. And there I went, and they all came back from all over. After all the years, all these young children, now men and women, and after I preached there, they stood, and one would walk up to me and say, Do you remember me, Uncle Keith? And I'd look hard at them and say, Oh, could it possibly be you? There they are standing with their children now, their own children. Boys I led to Christ, now men. Walked with the Lord all through the years, never backslid. One after the other coming. And then there was this fellow with his little beard. His black leather jacket. Do you remember me, Uncle Keith? And I said, Timothy. Oh, I must be getting old. Look at you, Timothy. You're a man. I said, Timothy, I remember you playing the fool when we preached hell. I'm so worried for your soul. You must be saved by now. Did you get through to God, boy? The tears just welled up in his eyes. Goodbye, Uncle Kim. He turned and began to walk, and I left everyone and walked out to him. I said, Timothy, Timothy, after all these years, you're not right with God. Can it be possible you're not right with God after all these years? Uncle Keith, I didn't come here for any other reason but to say hello to you. Don't speak to me, please. And he began to weep. He got on this big motorbike. I said, Timothy, you can die on that thing. That thing's a death trap. You could die right now. Don't take a chance of your soul, please, Timothy. Come pray with me. Get right with God now. He just looked at me. And then he revved this bike without a word and he sped off weeping. But he went. And I stood weeping. Father phones. Oh, Keith. Timothy's been involved in an accident. He's dying. That motorbike, I warned him, I begged him not to buy this motorbike. It's a death trap. Keith, he's dying without God. Pray for him, please. Pray for him. I'm going now to the hospital. They tell me he's on his way there. They don't think he'll make it. But Keith, he can't die. He doesn't know God. Pray. Please pray. And we got on our knees weeping to God. And later the phone rings, Mr. Ross. He says, Timothy's gone. He died. Did you manage to speak to him, Mr. Ross? Oh, Keith, when I looked at him, I thought he was dead when I looked at his body. The doctor said, he's not dead, he's alive. I said, oh, thank God. I grabbed hold of his hand and I shouted, Timothy, Timothy, boy, can you hear me? The doctor said, no, he can't hear you. It's no good speaking to him. This is my son. He's dying without God. He's going to hell. Don't you tell me not to try. Timothy, oh, Timothy. I always warned you, boy, this would happen. 
You're going to face God right now, Timothy. You're going to face God, and I know you can't face God. I know you're in sin to this moment. Oh, Timothy, if you can hear me right now, boy, while you've got a breath in your body, ask Jesus to wash you in the blood. Ask God to save you with the blood of Christ. Receive him as your Savior. Ask him to save your soul. Timothy, you've still got moments. Ask him. Timothy, boy, if you can hear me, if you are praying, if you are praying this prayer, if you're seeking God, Timothy, you owe this to me. I'll never rest if I don't know where you've gone, boy. Timothy, squeeze my hand. Squeeze my hand, boy. I know you can't speak, but tell me you've prayed. And oh, Keith, he squeezed my hand with such strength that even the doctor shouted aloud. And I looked at my boy as he squeezed my hand, and then he died. And I said, Hallelujah, Timothy, he's with Jesus. He's with Jesus. Oh, if your son faced death right now, what would be your last words to him? What would be your last words to him? But beware, beware, even facing death may not make you seek God. If you've hardened your heart continually and you think leading it to your dying moment, you can still seek God. Beware, even facing death may not make you seek God. If you've hardened your heart continually and you think you can leave it to your dying moment to seek God, I was walking into a hospital and one of the godly priests of our country was walking out and he was weeping. I said, what is it? Oh, he said, there's a man that died. He knew the gospel from a boy. He's been in the youth camps. He's been in the evangelical services. His parents loved God, but he never, never came to God. He just rejected God through all the meetings, rejected God's voice went for sin, they phoned me, his parents, they couldn't get to, they said, get to him, he's dying, they've got hold of us, he's been in an accident, he's dying, help him, he can't face God like that, oh, go and help him to find God before he dies, I rushed down here, I saw this man lying there dying, he recognized me, I recognized him straight away, though he'd grown up now, I said to him, you're dying, you're dying, you've got a few moments to live. For God's sake, give your life to Christ. Pray now. There's still time so long as you don't die without praying. Look to the blood of Christ now. In the last moments you've got, you've got moments. Don't die without praying. Pray. Ask God to save you. Do you know what he did, Keith? He looked at me as he was dying, knowing he had a few seconds left of life. He looked at me, begging him to prepare to meet his God. And he pushed my hand aside and he looked at the nurse. And he told her of all the terrible evil thoughts he had about her. And he died. He chose the last few seconds to sin rather than to prepare to meet his God. If you face death right now, would you die loving your sin more than your soul? Do you think that's not possible? If you face death right now, would you die loving your sin more than your soul? No matter what it costs, your soul. Oh, now is the acceptable time. God says, today is the day of salvation. If you will harden not your heart, God says, on the day of provocation. Don't blame God if you don't come. Now he wants you to come. Today he wants you to come. If you will harden not your heart, God says to you.
Come bow your head, please. I want to ask you very tenderly from the depth of my heart I want to ask all of you young young old preacher, minister 20 years in the pulpit Have you prepared to meet with God? If you face death right now, tonight, would you face it having prepared to meet with God? Would you face it with God's peace? What reason will you give God? What reason will you give God that you didn't? That you didn't prepare? Will he point to this meeting? What answer will you give him that you didn't? Prepare to meet with God. I want to ask every one of you tenderly. I know so many, the bulk belong to Jesus, but I know also there are those of you who God needs and waits for and expects young or old expects you to seek him desperately now while you still have in mercy another breath in your body another few minutes you don't know what argument have you got not to come to prepare for eternity tonight every one of you that doesn't know Jesus Christ that is not washed in the blood that the Holy Spirit does not bear witness with your spirit that you are saved from hell and you know it. Every one of you that needs to trust God for the blood to so cleanse you tonight and beg him for forgiveness for all sin in one moment the blood will wash away every sin you've ever committed and the Holy Spirit of God will bear witness with your spirit you're saved for eternity. What would keep you from that? I want all of you who need to trust God. While all our heads are bowed, those of you that need Jesus, will you please right now to stand where you are in your seat? And I'm going to look and we're going to pray with you. Will you stand, please? Thank you. We're waiting. Thank you. Thank you. You stay standing. All of you that stand, remain standing, please. No one's looking but me. And the Lord is looking. Come, thank you. We give time here. In the valley of decision, terrible valley, you're making a decision now to be Jesus Christ's property, washed in the blood of the Lamb, safe from hell. Thank you for all that standing. Any more that would want to face death with God's peace? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I know it's a battle, but I give time. Thank you. Once more I ask, Anyone here who God brought here tonight, who tomorrow could be gone, will you come tonight? Will you stand, please? These that stand, while all of our heads are bowed, I want you to come forward, please. I know that's not easy for you, but come forward right now to where I am. Just make your way past everyone, no one's looking at you. They're just praying for whoever you are, that's their lot now.
Can the whole congregation stand, please? O oh God, take these that stand before thee that would seek to be saved for eternity by the blood of Jesus tonight and do save their souls through and through. Save them so thoroughly that they may have a foundation that will never ever be shaken tonight. May each one become a man and a woman of God that will make a mark for God, every single one, in a remarkable, staggering way in this world. May they become men and women of the Word of God, of prayer, boldly testifying with such grace and wisdom and Christ-likeness that the hardened sitting sinner will not be offended but melted. Give them such a ministry and such a life and such a Christ-likeness. But tonight save their souls, Lord, thoroughly. And all the rest in this building who have men's blood on their hands, if they face death, help them to go now, not while they're dying. And to beg forgiveness for not warning before. And to warn in such a way that they won't offend but bring multitudes to Christ who they should have brought before. To all of us whose enemies may be facing death, give us the love of God to so love them that their words will stop in their mouths against us. That they will feel ridiculous hating us if we love their souls so much in spite of what they do. Take all of us that in the light of eternity we may live knowing we could face death right now and live accordingly to every soul we speak to, even if it's our enemies. Bless this group of people in America who love God. May they become an army, a force, that will conquer great, great victories for God against the devil, against the devil's stronghold. That they may go as an army on their knees and through their holy lives stagger this nation. Help them to stay low, knowing they're nothing without God but to stay real, soaking themselves in prayer and the Word of God daily and going out from their knees to win the lost to Christ daily. Oh, use them, Lord. Bless what remains of this convention that we may be holy, for Thou art holy. In Jesus Christ, Wonderful name. Answer our prayer. Amen. I would ask that all those of you here tonight who are able to go to go and to try and go silently, please, this night. And I'd ask your counselors to come right now and to take these people, I think, to chairs. I don't know if there are rooms. All right, would you please wait until we take the folks out? Could you please just go? Those who have to wait for you, it's their privilege to wait. They'll be praying for you and waiting to welcome you as a family of God when you come out. And don't doubt that God's going to take you. He will in no wise turn away anyone who comes to him through Christ Jesus. Nothing will make him turn you away if you don't listen to the devil. 
He'll take you now. Now, brother, will you come back to the pulpit? As we're about to close here, there are counselors in the back. Anyone else who needs to do business with God for whatever reason, you go ahead and make your way to the back as well as we dismiss, as we pray here. That's all right. The people that are with you will wait for you too. Let's bow our heads. Father, we bless you. We thank you for answered prayer, for speaking to us, God. We thank you. Oh, my God, we thank you. We ask you now to hear the cry of our heart for those that have gone back there, Father, that our prayers would go up for them and that we would groan and travail. And thank you, Father, for speaking to their hearts. We ask you to not leave us alone, God, but to continue to speak to our hearts. Do not leave any of us alone, God. We thank you for your Spirit that speaks to us. We ask your blessing now upon this group as we disperse, go to our homes or place of rest this night. Give us traveling mercies. Many have come hours just to be here tonight. Father, be with them. God, get our way. We thank thee, Lord, for each one. And we dismiss now in the precious and wonderful and altogether lovely name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Go in peace.